All right, we're going to get started with our technical track. My name is Brent Langston. I'm a developer advocate for AWS, and uh, I've been at AWS now for a little over a year. Uh, before that, I was at, I was actually with McKinsey, who you met downstairs, at Oscar and Tumblr. I've also uh, worked at Spotify and a, startup, a security startup called Cloud Passage. So we're going to start off today with Armando. He is a uh, solution architect, manager, and uh, rapid prototyper, would you say? Uh, so he's, he's used to like spinning things up very quickly, experimenting, and, and uh, he's going to talk a little bit about securing your customer's data from the very beginning. So uh, security is, is clearly a top priority. We want to make sure that you uh, are always operating as securely as possible, and we want you to be uh, up to speed with what all the options are and what you should be looking at. So take it away, Armando. Thanks so much, Brennan. Thank you. Uh, good startup day so far? Yeah, thumbs up? Fantastic. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the technical track. It's the first test, the first uh, session. Uh, one thing is, obviously, after lunch, there is typically a dip in energy levels. And what better topic to bring them up than talking about security? Yeah. Some of you are smiling, but I truly believe that, and I hope that by the end that uh, you, know, you will believe in that as well. Uh, I miss that. <laughs> but uh, my name is Armando Leite, as Brent was saying. So what I work in AWS is uh, I run a team that is focused on rapid prototyping. What we do is work with customers typically on uh, cycles that go up to six weeks maximum in developing the first iteration of solutions specific to them. These range from developing AI, ML models for analysis of subsurface data in oil and gas industry, down to IoT and in-car customization, autonomous driving. And obviously, we need to move fast, and we need to move securely. My whole background, I've been with AWS for five years. My whole background has always been on the security front in AWS, initially in London, then moving to Seattle and starting rapid prototyping roughly uh, six months ago. Now, when we talk about security, obviously there's always a few smiles regarding how um, you know, an interesting of a topic it is or, or, or how difficult it is in terms of getting in the way of people. And the reason for that is that uh, security, I'd say, that has been deliberately for a long time made hard. And it is made hard because normally the release cycles that you follow is you define baselines, you define what things should look like, you meet a certain set of security specifications or standards or regulations, and then you go live. At that moment, for about a millisecond, you trust what you have, right? It's great, fantastic. But business is not static. It moves, it evolves, right? You need to adapt your customers to you know, new demands, you need to change your business, and things change. And if you don't have visibility over what those changes are doing, over the impact they have in that pristine environment you had at the beginning, you very quickly start losing your self-trust in your own environment. Traditionally, also, security has involved um, you know, gatified uh, checks in which someone goes to a central organization and asks them, you know, is this good? Is this OK? Can you do us an assessment? Can you advise us how to go? And that slows things down a bit. So there's been a lack of automation that, uh, that uh, also contributes to creating this image of being a topic that gets in the way rather than being an enabler. And essentially what happens is that you know, businesses, and when I say businesses, I mean ranging from companies with hundreds of thousands of employees to you know, smaller startups with a handful of them, they want to move fast. We are in a digital economy. At the same time, they do want to move to stay secure, right? Digitally means that we are all about dealing with data and largely data at a large scale. Until now, this may have proven to be a difficult balance to achieve, but uh, you know, I truly believe that um, with AWS, and I should say with cloud in general, uh, that things have changed, right? Right now, being secure doesn't mean that we need to give up on convenience or introduce uh, undue complexity. So, so far, quite a few blunt statements, I guess. But now, how do we do it? So this afternoon, what I want to take you through, 
uh, over the next uh, 40, 45 minutes or so, is a prescriptive approach to security. I should set an expectation, which is that it is a 100 level topic. So I will be introducing a number of concepts and services uh, for those that are newer to, to AWS. Uh, more than happy if at the end you have questions or you'd like to discuss your specific use cases or specific services that you want to go more deep, more than happy to do so during this afternoon as well. Please. Uh, they, the video will be shared and the slides will be made available on SlideShare. Yeah. yeah. So there's a carrot, <laughs> to complete the survey. Uh, so what I'll be taking you through is through these topics. We will start talking about what we do internally in AWS, uh, because essentially that's the foundation that you build on top of. And then we will switch to talking specifically what you can do on your side. I have six topics in there, but uh, I'd ask you to keep in mind the mental model that I'll bring up a couple of times. Essentially there are five pillars to build a secure foundation on AWS. And I didn't extend that beyond AWS. The first one of them is identity and access management. How do you control access and give the right level of access to those that need it? The second one is once you define access is getting visibility, right? That was one of the things that slow does down at the beginning. So logging and monitoring sometimes also referred to as detective controls. The third one is once you define access, you have visibility, you start building your infrastructure, right? So infrastructure security. Third, once you have the infrastructure now, you can start putting your data. So now let's secure the data. And five, which I'll touch lightly uh, at the end, but it's a topic in which uh, I've spent quite a lot of time with in, uh, in AWS is, uh, you know, even if you start up and set uh, the best of best foundations, sometimes things can go wrong and you need to be prepared. So the fifth one that I'd say is to do with incident response and preparedness to deal with the, the unexpected. So let's get this going. From AWS internally, we, we approach uh, security in a, in, a, in a very specific way. Um, the first one is, you probably have seen this statement before from, from us, which is saying that security is job zero. Uh, there is a foundation to that. What we mean by this is that, you know, out of, even if you look at all the, you know, most of the businesses within Amazon, I'm saying most just in case, uh, some of them have some physical components, right? Even right now, the easiest one is a Whole Foods, people can go and shop directly. So even if something happens wrong on the digital world, there's still some, some, some assets that can be used. On the AWS side, the main thing that we do is host our customer's data, host the applications that works with that data. So it is key to us that we continuously earn trust, that we demonstrate that we adequately secure that data, that we do the right things. Uh, why is it job zero, not job one? I've gotten that question a couple of times. We are computer scientists, right? So arrays, you see, starting zero, so that's why it is zero. It is the first thing. It's the foundation from which we start. More important than the, the tagline is how we do it. We do it in two ways. First, it is distributed. And what I mean by that is every single team within AWS, every single product that you'll be doing, be it from compute like EC2 to some of our AI ML services like recognition or comprehend, they have security engineers embedded in them. What that helps with doing is uh, a couple of things. First is they are embedded, means that they are involved in all the discussions from the outset when the service is still you know, in a conceptual stage. Uh, as you may have heard about the way that we approach uh, development of new services and new features is working from the customer backwards and a component of that process is developing a press release and, uh, and an FAQ. And for sure, you know, even before the line of road has been coded, even before a whiteboard uh, illustration of uh, what the architecture could look like, those are the first two things. And I can assure you that those two things, either in the PR itself or in the FAQ, the security elements will be considered. Secondly, it is distributed. If we were doing what I just described and we had just a single central security organization that everybody was fighting for resources from, you know, we'd just be in the way of everyone else and it just slows things down as it often happens. A third element that I'd like to highlight in here is the ownership element. Um, 
what we say, what we mean by that is um, every single person that, let's say, is putting code together, that is writing code, they are enabled to verify that that code does the right things and it does it in a secure way. We have internal programs that uh, essentially allow developers to be qualified as what we call certifiers, uh, in which they get trained up and go through a mentoring program and then um, what you call it, a graduation program, which is about six months, uh, in which they learn how to look for the right things and also identify if there are any wrong things from a design, from a code, and also from a testing perspective. The, I said it was the last one. I often say one more thing. So I'll say one more thing on this one as well, which I think is very important as well. The other thing is we know that when performing um, you know, tasks manually, particularly if they are repetitive and at a large scale, uh, there is a high degree of potential or a high likelihood that you know, failure may happen. Even if the likelihood is, is low, you know, humans error more than instructions that are codified, that are put in some form of code. So we automate as much as we can. And that's what allows us to operate you know, our security controls at the very large scale that we operate globally. The interesting uh, one that I'll just like to highlight in, the, in this slide, I want to go into details into every single one of those, but this culture and way that we approach security is um, something that the customers benefit from. You know? And when I say customers benefit from, I think what, it, uh, what, uh, what uh, I want to, to say by that is it sets a level playing field that from the company that once again has the hundreds of thousands or millions of employees to you know, the person that woke up this morning and have an idea and they are starting their own company and just open a WS account, everybody starts on the same level playing field. Everybody gets the same level of security, quality, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, high standard that, uh, that uh, we operate by. So this is a bit of our culture and how we do things internally. Now, and this is a bit a team we are growing up, right? Some statements, now I describe what we do internally. But once again, you could say, yes, you work in AWS, so obviously you're going to paint a very rosy picture. It's not just about us painting the rosy picture. We do get uh, external uh, qualified uh, providers, uh, should say, and auditors and, uh, and uh, assessors to validate that we are doing the right things and that they are working effectively and uh, Dalit helps us build a foundation for compliance against a wide range of frameworks, meaning that it could be you know, things that are related to how you can operate in adherence to regulations in a specific country or geographical area, as well as ensuring that you operate uh, in, uh, in the right way when dealing with a certain industry. So us, we take care of a level of baseline that you can build up on top once again, regardless of your size or, or uh, of uh, how old or young the company may be. Everything that I described so far is um, what's happening here. It's about security of the cloud. It's what we do, and when I say we, I mean AWS, does to ensure that, uh, that um, the cloud, our cloud, remains secure. But that's not the whole story. There is a whole lot of things that we will start covering next, which are all about what you can do to tune up the security level uh, to your specific circumstances, to your business. Uh, to give you a very practical example, for example, someone operating in the financial services, which is a highly regulated industry, you know, it's dealing with money, money, there's a lot of appetites to get hold of it. Uh, so may have a different risk appetite to someone that is uh, operating, say, a news website in which most of the information is supposed to be published out there for everyone to see. So let's move away from what we do internally and start going to the uh, outside. And as I mentioned, those five pillars that we'll keep in mind. The first one is the identity and access management. So if you open an account on AWS, that is the first service that you interact with without probably even realizing. You need to log on to your account. Two key tasks that you know, should be ingrained in everybody's mind, which is you log on to your account for the first time. The first step that you should take, not should, that you must take, is secure that root account. 
by enabling uh, 2FA uh, or multi-factor MFA, multi-factor authentication. And second is put that root account away, uh, well, not just yet, create a second user that you are going to use as your administrator and put that right root account away in a safe place that you can use you know, if, uh, if uh, some kind of break glass type situation uh, comes up. That brings me to this topic. So I am is essentially all about defining who can access your account, the account that you just created on AWS, and what they can do. It gives you a wide range of uh, capabilities, you know, really, really broad. There's a session that I have uh, a link at the end, which is called I am Policy Ninja, which spends just one hour in describing you know, a huge range of possibilities uh, and that I really advise you to, 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 to take a look at. But if we just look at our 100 level, we'll say, I am, the first thing you can do is create users. Makes sense, right? People need to access their account, so we create your users. Second, it allows you to simplify the management of those users. If you have many users with similar access rights, you can group them. You create groups of users that require the same level of access. Thirdly, it offers something quite cool called IAM roles. What I like about IAM roles is um, it is a common need to, for example, have uh, a resource or a bit of code that needs credentials to perform some kind of action uh, in the platform, say making API calls, right? Uh, roles allow you essentially to associate a set of credentials that are dynamically generated and that are associated with, uh, with a resource, let's say an EC2 instance, and that uh, without you having to do any hard coding on your code. That's just one of its capabilities. Fourthly, the other key concept is policies. I talked about how you can um, be very specific in what actions you give access to. That's what the policies do. You know, they allow you to specify, for example, that someone is only able to access one service and only one specific API call for that service. Let's say that someone only job, I feel sorry for them, but their only job is to make sure that all the EC2 instances and, you know, and keep them account of them, right? So you could just give them access EC2 describe instances and that's the only thing they can do, nothing else. Now, these four things form the core foundation of identity and access management. There's quite a bit more capabilities. Nowadays, more often than not, one account is not sufficient and we will be looking at, uh, at uh, multi-accounts. Could be that you are separating, say, production from development. Uh, it could be that you are in a situation where the product that you are developing, uh, you want segregation between multiple customers and you create one account per customer to, com com to keep them completely apart. The good thing is that accounts themselves, uh, they cost nothing. You only pay for the resources. So let's say, for example, you have one account with two EC2 instances, T2 micro, uh, and you have two accounts, each one with one T2 micro, your billing is exactly the same, right? But the segregation that you have, you know, for the two accounts is the same thing as if it was two different people owning them. It also allows you, we have a service called the AWS organizations, which allow you to more easily and conveniently manage these multi-account structures. And uh, what uh, that allows you to do is things, for example, going to the example of having multiple customers, each one with one account uh, that you need to charge back to. Uh, you can have consolidated billing and in the billing reports, you'll see exactly how much each customer has cost and it makes much easier to make chargebacks. The next one is we have IAM, now we need to get visibility. To get visibility, it's all about detective controls, which is a very security specific term. But since we're talking about logging and monitoring, we want to see what's happening. We want to make sure that those access rights that we defined at the beginning, that uh, you know, people adhere to them, that there aren't too many failures, or that no actions are taken that uh, deviate from what you expected and set up at the beginning. Two key services that uh, I'd like you to keep in mind for that. First and foremost, CloudTrail. CloudTrail gives visibility over everything that is happening on the platform from an API perspective. And what we mean by that is anyone launching an instance, killing an instance, creating a user, changing the access rights, CloudTrail will journal all of that information. By default and for free, 
you get seven days of CloudTrail data that you can look up, uh, but you can configure it to actually, you know, keep that for a much more extended period. Uh, I recommend keeping it for a much more extended period because CloudTrail and I'd say log service in general, it's not just about security. They also help a lot with development, with troubleshooting, and with you know, a wide range of other, of other situations. Amazon CloudWatch, uh, what it provides you is the ability to do things like, for example, set up triggers that when it sees certain actions or actions that meet thresholds that you can customize uh, to drive alerts. For example, let's say you created five users and for your specific use case in business, you know that those five users are everything you are ever going to need. Unlikely, but bear with me for a second. You know? <laughs> so five users, that's it. You could have a CloudWatch uh, set up, a CloudWatch alarm that says, you know, if there is any other call to IAM and create user, let me know. You could even take it to an extent, I, will, I won't go into that in this session, but you could take it to an extent in which you say, this action has happened, let's say create a new user. You know and are absolutely sure you don't want you to do it. You could trigger it to call another service, call it AWS uh, Lambda, which is the execution of code based on events that would block that user. For example, remove all policies for the user while investigation takes place. But from this thing, the main I'd say, I'd say you know, CloudTrail is, is your friend and do enable it. Uh, the other thing I'd say on CloudTrail is um, when you enable beyond the, the free tier, uh, do so, I recommend, on a global basis for all regions. Uh, and the reason for that is with CloudTrail, you only pay for the storage. So for the logs that are generated and they are deposited in S3. Let's say Sydney and you have no operations whatever in Australia, you don't expect to use anything on the AWS platform in Australia. CloudTrail is enabled, nothing is happening, you're not paying anything, so zero. But eventually, let's say that one day, six months from now, all of a sudden, an event is deposited in your bucket for CloudTrail in Australia. That is a very high signal, low noise kind of situation that is a good indicator that, hey, I want to look a bit more closely into, into what's happening there. More than likely, it could be someone that made a mistake or anything like that, but it's something you want to be aware of. And for that event, or it could be even a thousand events, you know, you probably paid thousands of a cent for it. It was very cheap. <laughs> Let's jump to the next one. Access management, um, logging and monitoring, detective controls. Now we start to build our infrastructure. Uh, I won't dwell too much on those, but obviously we have um, a wide global presence and it keeps growing. Uh, the main message is that um, some countries and some regions, you know, they have specific laws that, uh, that uh, for example, dictate that if you are dealing with customers in that region, you need to keep the data locally. This enables you to do that, right? Uh, in case you may be suspecting it, but I'm originally from Europe, from Portugal. <laughs> so very strong, um, uh, or a very strong focus on, on privacy, for example, right? So there's quite a few, G yeah, yeah, I'll touch on that in a second, GDPR. So, a good way to deal with the European customers is actually to you know, make our bills and deployments happen in Europe. I just noticed an error in the diagram, <laughs> which is a minor one, uh, which is, uh, so when you are looking at, uh, at um, this circle, essentially they are indicating a region and the number indicates the number of availability zones, but uh, actually, Europe now, it's four regions, as it is here, and all of them have three availability zones. And we have uh, you know, a few more coming up, as, by the way, I should say, uh, which is Bar Bar Bahrain, Bahrain, Hong Kong, Sweden, and uh, another for AWS GovCloud, and we keep expanding, so these announcements keep coming regularly. But the key thing on that uh, perspective is you can choose a region that is adequate for the customer base that you are going to deal with and that is close to it. So it's not just, sometimes it could be things to do with performance and so on, 
but also from a data governance perspective that, uh, that uh, plays a strong role. Uh, we do publish uh, resources on GDPR uh, and have been quite close to it. There's a whole page dedicated to GDPR and how you can leverage AWS uh, resources to, to, to adhere to it. A lot of the services that we are covering today actually, actually make a big contribution to that, particularly when we touch on things like encryption. Who here has heard about VPC? Almost everyone. So VPC, virtual private cloud, essentially what it means, it's, it's, it's like when you are using for the first time compute type services, the VPC service allows you to define what your infrastructure looks like. In the good old days, and I'm showing my age here, um, you know, you'd attach a number of cables to these racks, etc. This is you are doing it uh, in the same way. You are defining your own network and defining how it is constructed in terms of defining its subnets, what kind of gateways and connectivity it will have. Uh, so essentially, if we talk about AWS account, is a segregation at a platform level. When you talk about VPCs and so on, it's a segregation at the network level in a way. It's specific to your account still, but now you are specifying how your account by defining subnets and uh, uh, larger containers that are called the VPC, how they will interact with the outside world over the internet. Uh, I say over the internet, but always keep in mind that internet access for a VPC, so for this network that you just arranged, is always optional. So do enable the first step they need to do actually to get, uh, to get some kind of um, internet access from a VPC is actually to attach an internet gateway to it. If there's no internet gateway, you know, that thing is still completely isolated. Um, common question that I get is, um, what would I do with this VPC, like a mini data center type thing, without an internet gateway? There's a lot of use cases. They tend to be, the, the ones that I come across more often, tend to be with data processing. For example, let's say you want to launch a Hadoop cluster to process a large chunk of data, spend a couple of hours doing it, and then just storing the result. You know, that thing launches automatically, does what it needs to do, writes out the output. While it is running, you don't want anyone to be logging in or out and et cetera. You know, it's, it's doing its own thing, runs for two hours, and then it gets shut down automatically at the end. So that's an easy example. Once again, touching back on visibility is uh, you also get sight of what's happening in your VPC from a traffic perspective. That's a service called uh, VPC Flow Logs that you enable, and essentially it will provide you a record of all the traffic that's going in and out, uh, what ports uh, were used, and uh, also gives you an accept or reject. So if the traffic was allowed in or if it was rejected. What causes the acceptance or rejection was something that um, I didn't really touch, touch on the previous slide, but uh, we have a number of ways to control traffic flows beside attaching gateways and routing, routing tables, which is security groups, which is a stateful firewall associated with specific instances, right, EC2 instances, and also network access control lists, which are stateless and are associated with subnets. So even if you have, a, let's say, something that is saying no traffic is allowed in or out, and it gets rejected, you can get a, a record of that. But let's say you are actually launching something that is external facing. Um, it could be that it is some kind of form of website, layer seven type thing. Uh, AWS is about, uh, WAF is about that. It's a web application firewall. Uh, out of the box provides you the protection against a number of common attacks, and it can also be highly customized uh, with specific ACLs that you develop or uh, with the regexes as well. The next one on the infrastructure that I'd like to test on, uh, touch on is uh, AWS Shield, which is uh, distributed denial of service protection. Uh, when I say there's something cool about this one or this thing is cool, it's because typically it's free. So AWS Shield, there's two components to it. One it is Shield Standard and the other one Shield Advanced. Shield Standard uh, provides protection against common uh, distributed denial of service attacks. Uh, attaches to our load balancers, to CloudFront, which is our content distribution network, our CDN, and it is free. You don't pay anything for it. Advanced provides some additional capabilities on top of that. Namely, it has a managed service type capability in which you know, if things are really going 
are becoming problematic, you may get someone to help develop custom rules to deal with that situation. It is aimed at customers that uh, have enterprise or business support. But the cool one is, by default, AWS Shield standard is there, you get that protection, and you don't pay anything else for it, which is pretty good. So let's get onto our fourth uh, pillar, right? I will uh, reemphasize identity and access management, logging and monitoring, infrastructure security, and now data protection. We defined access, we got visibility, we defined what our infrastructure looked like, now we are putting data in there. In their AWS, right? When we talk about that protection, there's two angles that we typically look at it from. One is protection of data at rest when it is stored, and the other is protection in transit when it is you know, flying between, uh, uh, between endpoints, which could be between your customers and uh, your applications, or it could be you know, B2B, it could be internally within AWS. Let's start with at rest, two key services that I'd like to touch uh, here. The first one is KMS. And, uh, KMS, for sure, at least for me, my biased opinion, is the coolest one of the two. Typically, managing encryption is quite a complex problem uh, and difficult to do. Uh, KMS takes a care of a lot of the heavy lifting. Things like rotating keys, things like generating new keys each time you need them, uh, things like allowing you to make encryption as simple as ticking a box, and from that point onwards, everything is encrypted. Uh, to give you an example of something that KMS does that uh, uh, I think is quite, you know, quite cool, is um, let's say the way that you work with KMS is you, you go to the service, you decide I want to create a new key, you know, the key is generated, and you assign an identifier to it, for example, my key. From that point onward, let's say you need to launch 500 EC2 instances, each one with uh, EBS storage. EBS are essentially our block storage. So we are launching a bunch of EC2 instances, 500, each one with these disk drives attached to them, which are our EBS service. You define when you want everything to be encrypted with my key. What actually happens in the background is that my key is something that is kept in a hardware security module and never comes out. My key, what is it used for, is to generate additional key material and to protect that additional key material. So for each of those 500, drives that we just created, each one of them is going to have one independent key, and each one of those keys will in turn be protected with the my key. The consequence of that is, and the scenario that I'm going to describe is in the realms of hypothesis and incredibly complex, and I'm happy to, to, to go deeper with you on it. But let's say that someone for somehow was able to get a key for one of those drives, right? If they are able to decrypt that drive, they cannot do anything with the other 499 because each one of them actually has an independent key that we typically refer to, or that the name is a DEK, a data encryption key. Now, take the 500 in this principle that I mentioned that the master key, the my key, is used to generate additional keys. The same thing applies in S3. And now we are not talking about 500 things. We could be talking about 500,000, 500 million, or even more. Uh, KMS can generate keys as I just described. You also have the option to import your own keys if you so choose. Cloud HSM, there may be situations in which you don't want to use or something forces you to not use the, all the managed capabilities that are available in KMS. That's what HSM does. HSM is a hardware security module. It is a safe, uh, a secure, bit of hardware that is validated and his only purpose is to deal with encryption operations, right? And provide secure encryption. Uh, Cloud HSM service, when you launch it, it means that you get one dedicated bit of hardware just for you. But it also means that no one on our side has access to the internals of it. And you take ownership over things that I just described, like setting up uh, how to renew keys, how to manage keys, how to refresh them. So you take a bit more of the heavy lifting. Uh, only one use case comes to mind that was related to that. I cannot say the name, but it was something to do with, uh, with, uh, with the digital rights management. Uh, and there was a, a specific requirement that KMS couldn't do it. 
and that other GSM was a way to do it. So it's very, very, very rare and becoming rarer and rarer its use. Uh, cloud, is, cloud is, yeah. is that compatible with all services or is that only like all services? Great point. Uh, thank you for that question. <laughs> KMS pretty much integrated with most services. Cloud HSM. Uh, there are some services in which it is integrated. RDS uh, is an example. Some of the databases in RDS. For all the others, no. But you have a high degree of control, so you can develop the code to do that. But once again, you take on the the, the responsibility of do, you know of building that capability. You know, you could build some kind of layer that uh, essentially makes calls to Cloud HSM and say, "Give me a new key, and encrypt an S3 object, and then store it." Yeah. Nothing prevents you from doing that. Yeah. ACM, and the theme is, it's a cool service. And why is it cool? Because it is uh, mostly free, right? If you use ACM to generate certificates uh, to be associated with, uh, with uh, services like uh, CloudFront, ELB, ALB, and so on, you don't pay anything. It's cool. Uh, it also has an option that uh, was released earlier this year about you having private certificate authorities. Uh, and in those cases, there is a cost. That would be situations in which, for example, you want to set up uh, encrypted communications using certificates between servers within your deployment. The CloudFront CDN is not a free service. There is a cost associated with it to do with volumes of uh, traffic that goes in and out kind of thing. <coughs> it is based on volume, but let me follow up after the presentation. The pricing is online, right? I, I just cannot recall it straight from my head. Yeah. Machine learning is cool, and you can also, we have a service that can help you with not just, we talked about encrypting the data, but sometimes you need to find it and make sure that uh, it is adequately protected. Macy is about that. It helps you with doing that, things like data classification, finding out what kind of data is out there, and if it has the, the you know, if it has the right setup around it as it should, and it also helps you with uh, doing some of the processing of cloud trail data as well. So, Let's touch on the last two. Uh, the last two essentially is config management, uh, configuration management. Config uh, is one of my favorite services. It's not free though, but, <laughs> but uh, it's close to it. It's very cheap. Think of uh, you know, a flight recorder, a black box. Config provides you that kind of capability. Sometimes you could say that you are looking at a firewall rule today and it meets your expectation. Everything is blocked. You looked at it in January, and it meets your expectation. Everything is blocked. But it may be hard to tell what happened between January and today. Was it always like that? Config gives you that kind of visibility. You can, as, what we describe about is that it can help you assure operating effectiveness. And you can also have config rules which allows you to add logic to process events from config and to react to them, be it alert or take a specific action. Lastly, automation and automate all the things. One is we have Trusted Advisor. It is free, the key bits, and you access it through the console, and it gives you automatically a sort of assessment that tells you what is the status of your account from a security perspective. Two, everything that I just described, or close to everything that I just described, can be codified. And when we codify that, it's a service called CloudFormation, in which essentially you describe your infra infrastructure as code. Uh, you create a template, and then you launch it. You can launch that multiple times. When I gave you the example at the beginning of multiple customers with individual accounts, you know, your service and product could be one CloudFormation template that you launch in each of those accounts. You know it's always going to be the same. If you need to relaunch something to, because there's been an update to the service, you, know, you can update it and just automatically make sure that everybody's getting the same level of service. And re-emphasizing to close is, uh, you know, security should not be a, a, a separate function. Uh, within AWS, as I mentioned, it is embedded. We do have a central group that essentially also acts as advisors to others, and that also owns a lot of our security products. But ultimately, security is about being embedded. As a last takeaway, uh, 
six principles, and they will be available online, but more than those six principles, it's identity and access management, logging and monitoring, infrastructure security, data protection, and incident response. There's free training online, do take it. It will go a lot more deep uh, into some of the topics that I just covered. And now for sure, my goodbye, I'd like to leave you with a, a few links that will further elaborate on what I just talked about. Uh, the incident response simulations is a presentation I did uh, uh, a year or so back with Coinbase uh, about how to test your readiness to deal with uh, security incidents. They may never happen, but you want to be ready to, to deal with it should it come. With all that being said, I'll be outside to take any questions. I think I'm just slightly overrunning. And thank you so much for your time. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Armando. We do have a couple minutes for maybe one or two questions. Are there any right here? Please. A big group of? Uh, malicious like IP addresses? Yeah, or, yeah. And yeah. can you repeat the question? For the yeah, camera? yeah, yeah. So, I don't know the gentleman's name, but uh, <laughs> Scott. Scott is, what Scott is trying to do is to block a large number of uh, IP ranges uh, because he doesn't want to accept traffic from them, right? Uh, you, you have a few options in there, you know. The AWS SWAF can help you with that. Uh, you can also have, uh, I'm thinking loud here, you, you, we also have a pattern that we have published, which is leverages the, wa the WAF for situations in which you are going beyond the limits of the number of access lists it can have. And essentially what it does is looking at cloud front logs, you know, looking at the front end of the distribution, detecting those and using Lambda to trigger and create automatically uh, a blocker rule. So there's two or three patterns in there, some of them that are related to using the native services and its capabilities. If you are hitting the limits and they cannot be increased for some reason, you can, Backtail that with uh, with uh, with Lambda and the logs that come, particularly from CloudFront, to to help with that. So would that essentially be an ACL? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Last question. Just a comment. I think you have some powerful plugins that have to do with zero patient like, Exactly. Use exactly. Use Great point. Yeah. Which is very well, very well, very well pointed out. Which is in some cases, if you, what you are doing, say. You want to block, I'm going to say my country, right, where I come from. But if you want to block Portugal, so I don't offend anyone, just myself. All right. You can for, just do that. For real, last question, right right back here. Yes. Are there any comments on the TLC services that might be seen that they might not be able to rely on outside sources? DLP, data loss prevention? Yeah, uh, I cannot comment on anything to do with roadmap. But the key service that we have on the DLP front is definitely Macy, right? Macy is all about finding out the data and its roots is definitely in the DLP side. I described it as a data classification service, but its primary use case and where it comes from is on the data, later, data loss prevention front. Yeah. All right, thanks everyone. Armando's gonna be around. He'll be outside mm -hmm. probably on the second floor, I assume is where you'll wanna- That's have. right, I'll be just out there. Cool. We also have a, a bar of architects that if you ever have specific questions like this and you want to go hit up some experts out there, uh, come by every day uh, for free and talk to uh, experts in all kinds of crazy topics. So uh, about two minutes, we're going to start up with our next speaker.